Tired of her mother-in-law's and husband's nitpicking, the wife came to work in a wealthy household. But she had no idea what surprise awaited her in the nursery. Julia woke up, as usual, at 7 in the morning. She didn't even need to set an alarm. Her body knew when it was time to get up. The bedroom was quiet, with only the soft snoring of David, peacefully sleeping beside her, breaking the silence. Julia carefully slipped out of bed, trying not to wake her husband. After taking a couple of steps, she stretched sweetly, feeling a pleasant heaviness in her body from yesterday's busy day filled with creative work. She had finished painting the nursery in gentle pastel colors, and the clients, a young family with moderate means, were thrilled. Thank you so much. Our daughter now thinks she lives in a fairy tale, said the client, Laura. Oh, it's nothing. May my work bring your daughter joy, peace, and comfort, Julia replied with a smile. This gave her strength and confidence, despite the constant doubts and mockery from some close people. This was especially true for David, her husband, a mid-level businessman who had always aspired to stability and traditional values. Unfortunately, he never understood Julia's passion for painting. He considered it a frivolous pursuit that did not provide a real income or security for the future. Again with your brushstrokes and paint, Julia. David often said, When will you finally find a real job? I'm already embarrassed in front of my mother. How are we going to live on your art? Luckily, my business feeds us. Karen, her mother-in-law, was even more critical and never missed an opportunity to jab at her daughter-in-law with biting remarks. Well, Julia, you're at it again with your paints. When will you finally find a real job that would actually benefit the family? Why not work as a manager or a secretary? Or have you decided to become a great artist? I hope you're not wasting our money on these pointless activities. At least you didn't take our last name. Otherwise, you'd bring us shame with your nonsense. The phrase came out sharp and very painful, but Karen was not the least bit embarrassed. Julia certainly tried not to pay attention to the cutting remarks, but sometimes the words hurt deeply. Of course, she understood that David and his mother simply did not share her passion for art. They saw nothing valuable in it beyond meaningless brushstrokes on a canvas. Sometimes, it seemed as if Karen deliberately chose moments to jab, humiliate, and make her feel like a failure. But on the other hand, her mother-in-law didn't work anywhere and had no intention of looking for a suitable job. It seemed she was perfectly content. Her son worked, and she dealt with the rebellious daughter-in-law as God had not blessed her with grandchildren. But today, Julia had a special feeling. A few days ago, she had posted an advertisement on a freelance website, and since then, she had eagerly awaited any response. Her mood was uplifted, as if the anticipation of something good hung in the air. She headed to the kitchen, where Karen was preparing breakfast. The smell of coffee and fried bacon filled the air, but the atmosphere was tense. Good morning, Julia said, trying to speak cheerfully, even though inside, she was tensing up at the thought of a new round of mockery. She never called her mother-in-law mom, as she believed that there could only be one mother. Good morning, Julia, Karen replied without turning around. You're awake? Time to get to work. I mean, to pick up your brushes. David, who had just entered the kitchen, looked tired but frowned upon seeing Julia. Haven't you checked your work email? I need to find some important documents, and the laptop is acting up again, he said, taking a sip of coffee. No, David, I haven't looked yet. I'll take care of that after breakfast, Julia replied, who also kept an eye on all the gadgets in the house. It would be nice to do it a bit faster, it's urgent, actually. Her husband grumbled, annoyed. Not wanting to continue the argument, Julia went to the living room to check her email on the home laptop. She turned on the computer, expecting to see another batch of promotional offers and other spam. But when she opened her inbox, she saw a message from an unknown address. Judging by the subject line, it was a request for wall painting in a country house. Her heart fluttered with joy. She quickly opened the email and struggled to suppress a joyful gasp. It was a substantial order, painting with a unique design in a modern style. Finally, something worthwhile. 
Julia exclaimed, unable to contain her excitement as she hurriedly scanned the details of the order. The style, color, special requests from the client. Incredible. I can finally prove to David and Karen that I am worth something. She whispered, covering her face with her hands. Overjoyed, she quickly called for her husband and mother-in-law to share the news. David, look. Julia shouted, showing him the screen. I received an order. It's big and original. Her husband, looking at the screen with skepticism, smirked. Julia, are you sure this isn't a prank? Or maybe another attempt to scam you out of your money under the pretense of work? No, it's really a genuine order. Look at the details, the conditions. This is serious work that can bring in good profits, Julia exclaimed. Oh, sure. And don't get your hopes up. At best, they'll pay you like last time, a pittance, Karen scoffed. Or maybe the client just wants to amuse themselves, mocking your foolishness. Tears welled up in Julia's eyes. Karen, please, there's no need to exaggerate. This is my chance to show what I can do. Well then, show us. I hope you're not planning to ask me for money to buy paints. Her mother-in-law remarked sarcastically. Her words stung painfully. Julia felt her eyes start to fill with tears, but she held back, knowing she shouldn't give in to her emotions. I can handle this and I'll do it on my own, she said, trying to suppress the tremor in her voice. Of course, who's against it? Just don't forget, I warned you. And don't expect me to help you with your art projects, Karen said, curling her lips in disdain. Noticing that his wife was upset, David tried to smooth things over. Mom, let's talk about this another time, okay? I have an important business trip coming up, and you're starting a debate about fine arts. Fine, son, it's your choice. But these paints and brushes are already piled up over here. I'm fed up. You'd be better off thinking about kids. Five years in marriage and still no grandchild. My friends are already laughing at me. They say soon they'll be lending me their grandchildren to babysit, the mother-in-law exclaimed in frustration. Julia didn't respond. She just nodded and left the room. She needed some time alone to calm down and gather her thoughts. Once in her room, she opened the email again and carefully studied the details of the order. First, she needed to develop a sketch, approve it with the client, and then get to work. I will definitely do this and prove that they are wrong, Julia whispered like a spell. After thinking for a moment, she picked up the paints and brushes that were on the table and began to create. It seemed that from her strokes not only sketches for future rooms were born, but also a new life for herself, full of color and confidence in her abilities. Julia spent most of the day working, making sketches, refining details, and planning the composition. She wanted to create something special that would impress the client and make everyone who doubted her reconsider their opinion. Finally, the sketch was ready. She sent it to the client with bated breath, waiting for a response. Hours passed. Julia couldn't focus on anything, constantly checking her email. All day, she felt like she was flying on wings. It seemed she could move mountains. Even her husband and mother-in-law seemed less irritating to her. Finally, the long-awaited response arrived. Your sketch is amazing. The client wrote, We are thrilled with your work. We want to collaborate with you. Julia could not believe her eyes. Her sketch was light, and she had received a great order. Excited, she hurried to share the news with David and Karen. Look, David. Julia exclaimed, showing him the email. They accepted my sketch. I got the order. We're starting work. Her husband looked at her with a hint of irony in his eyes. Although he didn't really hope that Julia would actually get this order, he said, Well, I'm glad it turned out this way. I hope you don't regret your choice, he said reluctantly. Karen, sitting in her chair, smirked meaningfully, making it clear that she didn't believe in her daughter-in-law at all. The next day, Armed with a GPS and a good mood, Julia set off to meet her clients. The challenge was that there were two garden streets in the city, 
and for some reason, communication with the client had been cut off at the most interesting moment. But Julia didn't let this discourage her. She decided to find the right house by the process of elimination. The country cottage settlement turned out to be quiet and cozy. Beautiful, neat houses, nestled in greenery, lined the winding paths. Julia struggled to navigate the area. The address provided in the email was not very informative. Finally, she found the right house. It was a two-story building with panoramic windows, surrounded by a high fence. A young woman with a cold, almost indifferent gaze opened the door for her. The homeowner was dressed in expensive but understated clothing, white trousers, and a formal sweater. Who are you? She asked instead of greeting Julia, not inviting her into the house. I'm Julia Carter, an artist and decorator. You contacted me regarding the wall painting, Julia replied, slightly embarrassed by the cold reception. The homeowner frowned as if trying to remember something. Hmm, you reacted quickly. The contractors who did my rough renovation must have been quite efficient. All right, come in, I'll show you the nursery. By the way, my name is Jessica, you can just call me Jessica, the woman said with a demeanor that suggested she didn't really need anything. Julia shrugged and followed her, fully aware that they had agreed in their correspondence to discuss the painting of the entire house, not just the nursery. However, what difference did it make? Maybe the client had simply changed her mind. As the saying goes, the wealthy have seven Fridays in a week. The house was almost perfectly clean. Everything was arranged neatly, with not a single unnecessary detail in sight. Julia walked with an indifferent expression into the nursery. It was a spacious, bright room with large windows. Here, she said, pointing to a blank wall, I want you to paint this. The theme is nautical with blue, white, a bit of gold, no cartoon characters. Just waves, ships, something beautiful and stylish. Got it, Julia said, surveying the room. I like your idea. And what about the cost? Jessica asked, looking at Julia with undisguised irony. I can provide a quote that includes the cost of materials and the complexity of the work. Overall, it will take about a couple of weeks, Julia replied, surprised again that she had already discussed this in their correspondence. Two weeks? That's quite long. Jessica replied, dissatisfied. Well, I need time to purchase the materials and, of course, to actually do the painting. It's done by hand, Julia explained. Jessica paused for a few seconds before nodding in agreement. Fine, go ahead, since that's how the cards have fallen. Just spare me all the inconveniences of choosing paint and so on. Of course, I'll take care of everything, don't worry, Julia readily replied. Then she cautiously asked, where is your son and what's his name? The question seemed natural, but Jessica's expression changed sharply. The wealthy woman's eyes narrowed with displeasure and her lips pressed into a thin line. Jamie is playing with the nanny right now, don't worry about him. Julia felt a sense of awkwardness. It suddenly seemed to her that the question had irritated Jessica or perhaps even angered her. Therefore, she decided not to press the issue, even though a strange feeling began to stir within her. It felt as if Jessica regarded her child with some inexplicable disdain and coldness. Julia said her goodbyes and left the house. Her mood soured a bit. She understood perfectly that getting the order was good and money was even better, but working in such a strange environment was not what she wanted at all. Julia had taken a few steps down the path when she suddenly heard a child's cry. It was coming from somewhere outside. She stopped and listened. The crying was loud, piercing, and filled with despair. Lord, what has happened to this poor child? Julia asked herself, looking around. At that moment, a nanny emerged from around the corner of the house. She was a tall, sturdy woman with a grim expression. She was leading a six-year-old boy by the hand who was crying uncontrollably. What's wrong with him? Julia asked anxiously. He fell off his bike, the nanny replied without looking at Julia. It's nothing serious. This little rascal is always getting into trouble. My name is Anna. 
You must be the substitute? Julia felt noticeably embarrassed. No, I'm an artist and decorator. I'll be painting the walls. Anna smirked. Oh, I see. Today is my last day here. I'm tired of it all. The client is difficult, and the boy is no better. Jessica will go out with her suitors to a restaurant while I have to sit with her son. No personal life for me. I've already gone through four nannies before me. None of them can handle it. He's not a child, he's just a problem. Julia didn't believe it. Her intuition told her that the boy was acting out for a reason. The little boy with big gray eyes was breathing heavily and his body shook with sobs. Maybe he's in pain? Julia asked. Oh, you know, it's none of your business. We had a medical checkup recently, so he's fine, the nanny snapped. Julia wanted to argue but then thought better of it, realizing that there seemed to be no room for kindness or sympathy in this family. Everything here felt soaked in indifference towards one another. Giving Julia a disapproving look, Anna took Jamie back into the house. Returning to her own place, Julia tried to avoid communication with her mother-in-law, who turned out to be eagerly awaiting her return. What? Already finished working? Why so soon? I thought you wouldn't slack off on your first day. Julia paled. Who told you I was slacking off? I actually familiarized myself with the scope of work and spoke with the client. Karen shook her head. Uh, that's all your work is. Communication, communication, and in the end, nothing. A puff of air. Well, of course, a lazy person, like a hunchback, can only be corrected by the grave. Tears sparkled in Julia's eyes. But why did all mothers-in-law behave like mothers-in-law while she ended up with this snake in human form? A mother-in-law should be like a second mother to her daughter-in-law, offering love and care. But what was here? Only reproaches from morning till night. If she paid attention to her husband and the home, it was still not enough. If she brought in little money, she couldn't have children either. If she started earning a lot, Karen would find another reason to criticize her. It was all about the desire. Deciding not to argue, Julia went to her room. Why spoil her mood, which was already hanging by a thread? Karen would never be satisfied. It didn't matter if she danced on her head or sang songs into a microphone, the result would be the same. She would receive her dose of negativity. Since David was off on another business trip, Julia spent the rest of the evening without leaving her room. She didn't feel like having dinner, nor did she want to see her mother-in-law's disgruntled face in the kitchen. For some time now, Karen had turned into a true guardian of the refrigerator. As soon as Julia reached for a couple of eggs for an omelet, her mother-in-law would be right there. Did you buy those eggs, dear? That's my son's money you're spending, or have you forgotten? Give yourself a separate shelf in the fridge and eat with your own earnings. But I already gave you everything I earned a couple of days ago. The amount is quite decent by our town standards, Julia protested. At such words, Karen's face would immediately turn crimson, making her look like one big overripe tomato. Decent money? The beggars on the doorstep have more. You'd be better off standing under a church with your hand out. That would be more productive. Julia's nerves usually couldn't withstand such exchanges for more than two minutes, so she would retreat to her room. Just like now, left alone with her paints and easel. It was truly a wonderful moment when inspiration visited the creator. In the room, filled with the smell of coffee and watercolor, a creative atmosphere reigned. Julia was fully absorbed in her work, creating a comic that reflected her life. On paper, alongside the black and white sketches, colorful drawings sprang to life like frames from an old movie. There was little Julia with big eyes and freckles on her nose, running barefoot across a green lawn, beyond which stretched golden wheat fields. Nearby, a kind grandfather in a straw hat tended to his beehives, while a grandmother with wrinkles around her eyes, like a net of fine lines, smiled as she looked at her granddaughter. It was a graphic story of her own life, full of sunny summer days in the countryside, the scent of honey, and the mysterious prophecies of Grandma Penny. 
Julia thoughtfully applied strokes with the tips of her fingers, stained with purple and blue paint, bringing life to her little world drawn on paper. I need to add a bit of pink, the woman murmured, and here, Julia happily drew a mischievous bee into the comic, Grandpa Norman teaches me to distinguish between flower honey and buckwheat honey, but I keep mixing them up and getting sticky with the golden sweetness. Vivid images popped up in the young artist's memory one after another. The summer sun flooding the meadows with golden light, the aroma of blooming linden trees, honeycomb full of sweet, viscous nectar. There was Grandpa Norman, with a beard like a fluffy dandelion, in a worn bathrobe, telling stories about the lives of bees and the importance of preserving nature. Grandpa, why are bees so hardworking? Little Julia had asked back then, watching the insects buzzing around the flowers. She still remembered how the sticky honey dripped down her hands while her grandfather laughed, wiping her face with a soft towel. On the paper, Penny's easily recognizable profile began to emerge. Julia depicted her grandmother as strict yet kind, with an amber necklace and wrinkles around her eyes, like maps holding ancient secrets. Grandma, why do you always look at people's hands? You know, the ones who come to see you? Julia asked as she climbed onto her lap. Because their fate is written on them, Grandma replied, stroking her small palm. Each line tells a story, a joy, and a sorrow. Penny knew almost everything about people. She could see the future and read their destinies. Julia often sat beside her grandmother, mesmerized by her calmness and wisdom. You will be an artist, Grandma said one day, peering into the lines of Julia's palm. You will create beauty, and people will rejoice in your creations. Childhood encompassed a whole gallery of bright, sunny colors. And then, then gray, rainy days came into Julia's life. Her mother, Pamela, left, leaving behind only emptiness and pain. Julia was still very small, only five years old, and didn't understand why her mother no longer smiled. She didn't know why her mother's eyes became so sad after visiting Uncle the doctor at the local hospital. And then she disappeared, leaving behind only sweet memories and a grave mound with a cross in the local cemetery. Mommy has gone to heaven, to the stars, Grandma said, trying to explain to Julia the irreplaceable loss. She has also become a little star and now takes care of us. Remembering this, Julia drew a sad scene. A little girl stands by the window, looking at the sky, with bitter tears rolling down her cheeks. Then Daddy left. Not to heaven, but to another family, leaving Julia in the care of her grandparents. The little girl felt abandoned and unwanted. Why doesn't daddy love me? Julia cried, pressing against her grandmother. Why did he leave me? He just doesn't know how to love. Not everyone is capable of true feelings, Penny said quietly. At that moment, Julia depicted her father in the comic, walking away into the distance. His figure became smaller and smaller, while Julia stood with her head bowed, feeling lonely and betrayed. But I will always love you. You are the only ray of light in my life, her grandmother whispered. Julia grew up and graduated from school. By that time, Grandpa Norman had already passed away. A stroke had taken him. Grandma was left alone, but nevertheless found the strength to carry on. Julia knew she had to leave the village to find herself in the big city and become independent. She returned to the comic. She drew herself as a student, diligently studying textbooks and preparing for exams. Then she captured herself standing in front of an easel with a brush, surrounded by bright colors. In the city, Julia enrolled in university. She chose the profession of an artist decorator. She studied, worked, and dreamed. She also created beauty, bringing walls to life with her paintings. She depicted flowers, birds, and various landscapes. All her works, without exception, were full of light and joy. Julia, you are very talented. Her professor would say, You have golden hands. Thank you, Mr. Davis, she replied, feeling her heart fill with warmth. I just love what I do. She continued to paint. In her next drawing, she depicted herself sitting in a cozy cafe with a cup of coffee. Next to her was an unfamiliar young man. 
A dark-haired handsome man smiled and looked at Julio with tenderness. David, there was no doubt that it was really him. They had met in the park, where Julia entertained children by drawing with colorful chalk on the pavement. A tall, slender guy approached her and smiled. Your works are simply amazing, said David. You are a true magician. Julia blushed and felt shy. She had never heard such words before, especially from a young man. Thank you, that's very nice. May I introduce myself? The guy asked. My name is David. I'm Julia, the girl replied, feeling her heart start to race. Then, in the comic, she depicted their first meeting with a few strokes. She portrayed David with a tender gaze and a smile, surrounded by flowers, sunlight, and joy. Julia, I love you, David said one day, holding her hand, you are my life and inspiration all at once. Julia didn't hesitate to illustrate on paper a kiss and her smile filled with happiness. There was also space on the album page for her mother-in-law, whom the young artist depicted as a fire-breathing dragon. But unlike the fairy tale character, Karen didn't breathe fire. Instead, she unleashed waves of criticism and insults. Finally, Julia finished drawing. She leaned back in her chair and smiled. The story of her life, full of joy and sorrow, love and loss, was captured on paper in bright, vivid colors. The next morning, she returned to Jessica's cottage, armed with paints, brushes, and ready sketches. The homeowner greeted her as coldly as the first time. I hope you can manage, Jessica said, don't disturb Jamie, he's sleeping. All right, Julia replied, and began to work. The first hours passed in silence. Jessica appeared in the nursery only to ensure that the work was proceeding as planned. Julia tried not to pay attention to the cold atmosphere and focused solely on her creativity. At times, it felt to her that she was depicting not just a nautical theme, but something deeper and more significant. Closer to evening, while working on a sketch of a sailing ship, Julia heard a child's voice behind her. Auntie, what are you drawing? Julia lowered her gaze and saw Jamie standing in the doorway. Small, thin, with big sad eyes. A sailing ship, she replied, smiling. It's beautiful, Jamie said. Can you tell stories? Yes, I love telling stories. The boy looked at her with interest. Can you tell me one? At least one or two. Julia nodded in agreement and sat down on the floor, inviting Jamie to join her. Then, after going through a few stories in her mind, she began to tell him about the sea, a ship, and distant lands. Jamie listened, breathless. His eyes sparkled with delight, and a sweet smile never left his face. Along the way, he asked questions and listened again. At some point, Julia suddenly felt a special connection forming between them. She also understood that the boy needed affection, attention, and warmth. Julia became so absorbed in the conversation that she didn't even notice when Jessica entered the room. The homeowner's face was set in an angry expression. What's going on here? I don't understand. Are you entertaining my son or actually working and fulfilling your duties? The young artist jumped in surprise and dropped her brush from her hands. It fell onto the protective covering on the floor, leaving a small reddish stain. Jessica grimaced. For this to be the first and last time, I need quality from you, not for you to come here for a whole month and play the fool. All right, Jessica, I'll do everything, Julia replied, regaining her composure and looking guiltily into the boy's eyes. Jamie frowned and trudged into another room, which temporarily served as his playroom. Julia didn't understand why Jessica was so cold towards her son and why such a good boy couldn't keep a nanny. In Julia's opinion, Jamie was a great little guy and only threw the slightest tantrums for his age. Perhaps if Jessica spent more time with him, he would open up to her like a tender flower to the sun's rays. But for some reason, Jessica didn't do that. She looked at her son as if he were not her flesh and blood, but someone like a servant. The end of the workday felt chaotic. The joy she had received from talking to Jamie was overshadowed by Jessica's cutting remark, who had suddenly behaved so aggressively for reasons unknown. 
At one point, Julia even felt as if she had been communicating with two different people via email. Finishing for the day, she closed the room and headed for the exit. If you need an advance, take it from the table, Jessica called over her shoulder as if she had decided to either make amends or spur the worker on with money for more active efforts. Thank you, but I have money. Let's wait until I finish the work completely, Julia replied as she stood in the doorway. In truth, she really needed the money, especially considering Karen's constant nitpicking. But on the other hand, if Julia gave her mother-in-law a deposit, what was the guarantee that tomorrow she wouldn't come up with new complaints? Weighing the pros and cons, Julia mentally praised herself for holding back and not taking the advance. To be honest, she felt some anxiety about how Jessica would evaluate the final result of her work. Julia had already experienced a situation where a client refused to pay, nitpicking over some minor detail. At that time, David had offered to handle it, to involve the right people who could collect debts from anyone. But Julia didn't want that. Deep down, she felt hurt by the client's refusal, who hadn't appreciated her talent. Since David was still on his business trip, she didn't feel like rushing home. And what awaited her there? Karen's perpetually dissatisfied face, who had surely grown bored of sitting at home all day and was just waiting for a convenient moment to poke at her daughter-in-law again. Deciding to stop by the store and buy something delicious for dinner, Julia turned towards the nearest supermarket. It was packed with people, and the long lines at the checkout indicated that she had come during rush hour. However, Julia wasn't discouraged, and after grabbing a basket, she began to explore the shelves. Suddenly, her attention was caught by the shout of a security guard. What is this homeless person doing here? Who let him in? Get out of here. I know you. You come here in your wheelchairs, and then we have to search you at the entrance. Julia turned around and saw a bewildered man, about 35 years old, in a wheelchair, who was looking sadly at the guard and trying to explain that he wasn't a thief, just trying to buy some bread and milk. I know you. What bread? You probably came here for vodka. You've gotten so brazen lately that you drink alcohol without even leaving the store. You drink, then put the bottle back in place. And what do you want me to do? Pay for the shortage out of my own pocket? The guard pressed. Customers looked at the unfortunate man with evident discontent and shook their heads. Some truly believed he was a vagrant trying to elicit sympathy with his appearance, while in reality, he wasn't disabled at all. But for some reason, Julia immediately felt that this man really needed help. Approaching the security guard, she gently touched his sleeve and said, Excuse me, could you let this man through? I know him well, he's not a vagrant. The guard turned around and gave Julia a displeased look. Oh, you know him just like that? Next, you'll say he's your neighbor or a co-worker. Julia struggled to suppress a smile and winked slyly at the stranger in the wheelchair. Yes, he really is my neighbor. He lives at 15 Forest Street. I can assure you, he won't steal anything from the store. He's not a thief. The guard looked noticeably flustered as Julia's tone didn't give him the opportunity to unleash all his aggression on her. Well, since you know him, then you keep an eye on him. But keep in mind, if he steals anything, you'll be the one paying at the checkout, and it will be triple the amount, including a fine, the guard said as he stepped aside, looking for a new target. Thank you. You really helped me out. I'm not a thief or a vagrant, the man began to justify himself, fiddling with the wheels of his wheelchair. Julia smiled. Oh, come on, I understand. These guards are just waiting for someone to take out their frustration on. The pay is low, and you walk around in uniform all day looking for rule breakers. When you do this day in and day out, every customer starts to look like a criminal. But that's when all sorts of misunderstandings happen. Doctors call it professional burnout. The man looked at his new acquaintance with interest. Are you somehow connected to medicine? Julia shook her head. Actually, no. I'm an artist. But I've read some psychology books and know a bit about it. The man smiled and then said, 
Well, I have the most direct connection to medicine. Or rather, I used to. My name is Stephen. Last name Russell. I'm a general practitioner by profession. In the past, I had a lot, a house, a family, and a job, but everything changed after that unfortunate accident in the mountains. The safety cable snapped, and I fell into a chasm. Julia froze in surprise. How did you get out of that gorge? Stephen paused for a moment, as if tasting the words, then continued, still turning the wheels of his wheelchair toward the shelves of fresh pastries. How did I get out? Oh, that's a long story. To put it simply, no one came looking for me. The rescuers refused to go due to the danger of an avalanche. So I crawled for several days over snow and rocks until I reached the river. There, some fishermen picked me up and called for a rescue helicopter. Julia looked sadly at the place where Stephen's legs should have been. Only now did she notice that the remnants of his injured limbs were forlornly covered with a wool blanket, apparently to avoid shocking those around him. Catching her gaze, he nodded knowingly. They diagnosed me with frostbite. I begged the doctors. I implored them by Christ and God to save my legs. I'm a doctor myself, practically a colleague, but apparently it wasn't meant to be. Gangrene set in, and then blood poisoning began. The surgeon had no choice. When I woke up, I couldn't believe my eyes at first. I thought it was a nightmare. I crawled out of bed twice and made my way to the window. I thought about ending my life. My wife filed for divorce right away, even though she was pregnant with my child. But it turned out she was lying. She got pregnant not by me, but by a wealthy businessman. So, I had no reason to live then. Stephen's story shocked her to the core. At that moment, she suddenly wanted to scream at the top of her lungs because those around them simply walked by and didn't even notice the man whose life had derailed at the speed of a crazed locomotive. Not knowing what to say, Julia just stood beside him and looked into the eyes of this kind, slightly sad man. When I crawled to the window for the third time, the department head couldn't take it anymore and called a priest for me. He came, explained everything, and pointed me towards a new path in life. In short, I changed my mind about throwing myself out the window and started working as a dispatcher at the ambulance station. I don't know anything else besides my medicine, and being a vagrant is not for me. So, I'm saving money for new prosthetics. The pay isn't great, but I save every penny. I cut back on clothes. And these guards take me for a vagrant, thinking I came here for vodka, Stephen explained. At that moment, Julia looked at her new acquaintance with different eyes. Then, giving in to a surge of compassion, she suddenly grabbed a fresh loaf of bread from the shelf, adding a couple of bottles of milk to it. Here, please take this. My name is Julia. I come here often, so I think we'll see each other again. But now, excuse me, I need to go home. Stephen nodded understandingly, but still declined the offered food. It felt awkward to say anything. Throughout the return journey, Julia couldn't stop thinking about the twists of fate that had turned the doctor's life upside down. And at home, she was once again met with a scandal. Of course, it was started by her mother-in-law, who was unhappy that her daughter-in-law had returned home a little later than usual, igniting a storm of indignation. Oh, look at you, wandering around with men. I'll call David immediately and tell him everything. Where could you have possibly been for so long? You came home earlier yesterday. What's changed today? Or are you looking for a lover while my David is working hard to provide for you? Julia's cheeks instantly turned crimson with shame. Her mother-in-law's remark struck at her heart. How could she reproach her for coming home half an hour later than yesterday? Karen, you must have misunderstood me. I explained that today I would have a full workday, Julia began, struggling to compose herself. But this had no effect. The mother-in-law resumed her tirade about how the daughter-in-law didn't love her son and was just waiting for a chance to stray. Thus, the evening argument ended with Julia, just like the day before, locking herself in her room, trying to ignore her mother-in-law's angry remarks. Taking her smartphone in hand, she wiped away a stray tear and tried to dial David's number. 
but, as usual, he was silent. The indifferent voice of the mobile operator informed her that the subscriber was out of service. Well, there it goes again. His phone is off. What kind of negotiations can happen at this time? Julia thought sadly and set the smartphone on her nightstand. Her mood soured again. Deciding to go to bed early, she hastily had a snack and headed to the bathroom. By that time, Karen was already sitting in front of the TV, commenting on another soap opera. The night for Julia passed relatively peacefully, if not for the dreams inspired by the former doctor's stories. For some inexplicable reason, she dreamed of mountains and a dangerous ascent to the very peak where respect and honor awaited every brave soul. Early in the morning, tired of the intrusive visions, Julia got up and, to pass the time, began to sketch another design for her upcoming work. Deciding not to wait for her mother-in-law to get up, Julia left the house an hour earlier to grab a cup of coffee with a croissant on her way to work and head to Jessica's house. She was surprised to see Stephen again near the store, eagerly wheeling himself back and forth like a teenager on his first date. When he spotted Julia, he was very pleased, wheeled closer, and within seconds, a rose appeared in his hand, as if by magic, on a long stem. Its delicate pink petals fluttered in the wind, causing Julia to freeze in place. The last time she had received flowers was five years ago, on the day David had proposed to her and splurged on three white roses, which Karen had long remembered, complaining about the excessive spending on floral arrangements. Thank you, Stephen, that's very kind of you, Julia said with a smile as she accepted the flower from him. No need to thank me. I wanted to express my gratitude for your help yesterday. If it weren't for you, that guard might have kicked me down the steps or, worse, called the police, Stephen explained. Julia's mood noticeably lifted. She felt like birds were singing in her heart and she wanted to soar in the clouds like a fairy tale sprite. All thanks to this single flower, which had decided to express its gratitude of its own accord. Julia caught herself thinking that he, a person with disabilities, cared for her better than her husband, a businessman who was always too busy with work projects to find time for her. To the young artist's surprise, Jamie opened the door for her today. Where's your mom? Julia asked cautiously. The boy shrugged, then mumbled something incomprehensible about his mom not feeling well after last night's trip to the restaurant. Julia frowned. To be honest, she would have given anything not to hear the boy's words and not to delve into the details of Jessica's personal life. Only now did she realize how right Jamie's former nanny had been when she said that the mother didn't care for her son at all. Would you like me to tell you a story while your mom sleeps? Julia suggested, glancing around discreetly. The boy smiled. Of course. And anyway, she's not my mom, she's my stepmother. Dad said that mom died when I was not even a year old, and then he brought Jessica home. Julia paled. So she's your stepmother, and I thought you were related to her. Jamie waved his hand dismissively. No. Maybe that's why they hate me. My dad died in an accident. Something happened with a wheel while he was going full speed, and since then, Jessica has taken care of me. I don't really like it, but what can I do? That's why I have to act out to get attention. Maybe someone will help and take me to a children's home, far away from Jessica. The boy's confession stirred a true storm of feelings and emotions within her. How could she have known that Jessica was not Jamie's biological mother? But worse than that was the fact that, according to the boy, Jessica fully enjoyed the money of his late father and behaved as if she were a wealthy heiress rather than a guardian to an orphan child. While telling Jamie another story, Julia thought about how she could help this little boy escape the oppression of his hateful stepmother. But she didn't get to finish her tale, as her smartphone lying in her bag vibrated invitingly, signaling an incoming call. Since Jamie was closer, he unhesitatingly handed Julia the smartphone while looking at the caller's picture. At what the boy saw, he felt uneasy and instinctively recoiled. Still not understanding his reaction, Julia took the phone and saw David's face on the screen. Her husband was calling her via video chat from his business trip. Ah, uh, hi, Julia. What are you up to? 
Looks like you're painting another mess on the walls, he asked in his usual mocking tone. I just found myself a new job, Julia replied calmly, trying not to pay attention to the obvious taunt. David nodded knowingly, then continued. And here I am again in negotiations, damn it. I'll probably be delayed, I won't make it home today. At least I'll be gone for a couple more days. The foreign investors let us down, they didn't show up for the meeting. Something happened with their flight, apparently, it was cancelled. As if that makes things better for me. Juliet noticeably darkened. Great. She would have to spend another evening alone, listening to the discontented mutterings of her mother-in-law, who seemed like a harpy, always on the lookout for her next victim as darkness fell. After talking a bit more with her husband, Julia wanted to wish him well and blow a kiss when David ended the call. She sighed sadly and put the phone back in her bag. At that moment, she glanced at Jamie and saw that the boy was looking at her with a hint of worry on his face. Is something wrong, Jamie? She asked cautiously. The boy looked noticeably embarrassed, as if unsure whether to tell this kind aunt the truth or keep quiet for a while. But then the desire to do something good proved stronger. Jamie quietly said, I'm sorry to say this, but I've seen that man from your phone before. He often comes to see my stepmother, and then they go to a restaurant or somewhere else. Julia nearly choked in surprise. Are you sure? Maybe you're mistaken. Jamie shook his head negatively. No, I'm not mistaken. I even know his name, David. My stepmother always waits for him to come, trying to cook something delicious, but on ordinary days, she never does that and orders food delivery instead. Julia's lips trembled traitorously. Cold sweat beaded on her forehead. God, does this mean that my husband has been lying to me all this time, she thought, desperately holding back tears in front of the child. Her world was shattering into pieces, like a crystal castle besieged by dark forces. She, a talented artist and decorator, felt helpless. A world that was once painted in bright colors suddenly seemed black and white, dull, and lifeless. Inside, everything twisted with pain. Julia remembered how she met David, how her future husband looked at her as if she were the only treasure in the world. She, a foolish girl, believed, trusted, and loved. And now all of that was crumbling under the weight of doubt and emotional pain. Taking her phone, she stepped out of Jessica's house and dialed her husband's number. Work no longer held any meaning or significance for her. The ringing seemed endless, as if playing on her already taut nerves. David, it's me, Julia. Julia, what do you want? We've already talked about everything, her husband replied, and his voice carried a sense of detachment, as if he were speaking not to his beloved wife, but to a colleague discussing work matters. I need to talk to you, Julia said, struggling to hold back tears. I'm busy. Call me back later. No, David, I can't wait any longer, Julia insisted. A lump caught in her throat. She swallowed hard, trying to speak evenly, without hysteria or baseless accusations. I know you're cheating on me. Silence hung in the air. Heavy, tense. Julia felt the blood drain from her face, leaving behind an icy void. Are you out of your mind? What makes you think that? Was all David could say, confusion lacing his voice. It doesn't matter, Julia replied. I can't and don't want to live in this lie anymore. Julia, please don't say foolish things. Her husband began to justify himself. It's not at all like you think. Stop it, David. Julia interrupted him closing her eyes to hold back tears, it's all clear. You've been leading me on all this time. I'll give you credit, you're a great actor. Goodbye. With that, Julia hung up. The tears she had held back for so long burst forth in an uncontrollable flood. She fell onto the lawn, hugging her knees. She had loved David. She believed in their feelings, envisioning how they would grow old together, sitting on the porch, holding hands, and watching the sunset. But now her world had collapsed. How could she have been so blind? Why hadn't she noticed the signs her unfaithful husband was giving her? 
Apparently, it's true what they say, sometimes it's much more pleasant to be mistaken than to live in reality. And so Julia lived in a watercolor painted world until a hurricane with a torrential downpour washed her fantasies down the drain. Turning around, she noticed Jamie watching her from the window, his arms crossed in prayer against his chest. She smiled and waved goodbye to him. Julia knew she would definitely return, but not for the money, rather, for the little boy who had fallen under the oppressive weight of his greedy stepmother. That evening, Julia didn't go home. She settled for a room in a cheap hotel. Karen was furious, practically spewing venom through the speaker of the smartphone. But Julia hardly listened to her. She was only thinking about how to get back at David and Jessica for treating her so cruelly. However, when she checked her email, she felt uneasy. It turned out she had mixed up the addresses, and instead of contacting her client, she had reached out to a completely different customer, who believed that the artist had been sent by the contractor handling her home renovations. Oh, if only Julia had known that the villainous fate would lead her straight to her husband's mistress. The next morning, after putting her husband and mother-in-law on the blacklist, Julia consulted a lawyer specializing in family law and filed for divorce. At the same time, she wrote to the Guardianship Council, requesting an investigation into Jamie's stepmother and subsequent revocation of her guardianship rights. But the biggest surprise awaited Julia ahead. When a representative from the Guardianship Council sent a commission to Jessica for an inquiry, it turned out that Jamie's biological father was Stephen Russell, the very same doctor who had lost his legs. Many years ago, his unfaithful wife had left him for a businessman while pregnant by her lawful husband. However, this fact had been concealed by the woman. Although Stephen was listed as Jamie's father on the birth certificate, the young doctor was not infertile. Rather, there had been a mistake in the lab processing the analyses. Did Stephen's wife know this? That remained a mystery. After all, Kate had started cheating on her husband months before the accident in the mountains. Subsequently, Kate Russell died of pneumonia, and Bruce, the adoptive father whom the boy believed to be his biological dad out of ignorance, brought Jessica into the boy's life. The news about the discovery of his son struck Stephen like a bolt from the blue. Crying, the former doctor hugged Julia without saying a word, grateful that her appeal to the guardianship council had revealed the secret of Jamie's birth. Son, my God. I have a son, my flesh and blood. Stephen whispered, rejoicing that a ray of light had appeared in his life. Julia smiled, genuinely happy that, unknowingly, she had helped a father find his son and a little boy find a pair. The divorce had gone almost seamlessly for her. David was unable to prove his imagined righteousness in court and lost half of the assets acquired during his marriage to Julia. His mistress, Jessica, was even less fortunate especially after social services stripped her of her guardianship rights, along with the millions stored in the bank accounts of Jamie's late adoptive father. It turned out that David, with his mistress's approval, had also managed to tap into the young heir's assets, thus finding a true gold mine for himself. But everything comes to an end. After finding his son, Stephen was literally soaring with happiness for a while. And when he took his first step on his brand new bionic prosthetics, which Jamie had purchased, he felt an inexplicable surge of strength. Hugging Julia, Stephen promised her that he would return to medicine and become a doctor again, just to spite everyone. Julia smiled in response, and then, to Jamie's approving exclamation, she picked up a pencil and drew a new scene from her graphic comic about life. There she was again, standing in a wedding dress alongside a tall man who walked with a slight limp and a boy whose eyes sparkled with joy at the sight of his parents getting married. Bitterly, Julia diligently wrote with her pencil and after kissing Stephen, she went to choose a wedding dress.